All right. Well, thank you guys all for showing up today. Um, I'm Katie Hammond. I'm with the Downtown Troy Business Improvement District. Um, and we're happy to have Jared Paul here from Capable Wealth. Um, we've had some nice networking opportunities this morning. Uh, so thank you for showing up early and having that opportunity. Uh, it's a crazy time right now. Uh, and there's a lot of businesses that are either starting fresh, um, people who have um, maybe lost their job at this point, um, are, you know, they've thought about opening a business for a long time and kind of now's the opportunity for that. Um, and then there's a lot of businesses that, you know, we're thinking outside the box and maybe even throwing that box out and trying to recreate ourselves um, during this time. So uh, I appreciate you guys stepping in today and uh, for Jared to be here to help us through these conversations, um, you know, talking about how can you set yourself up uh, to, to reach that inflection point in your business where you're consistently making income and, and growing your business. Um, so Jared, do you mind introducing yourself and a little, tell us a little bit about Capable Wealth? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as Katie mentioned, uh, my name is Jared Paul. I'm the managing director of Capable Wealth, which is a, a registered investment advisor. It's a financial planning firm uh, based out of Albany, New York. Have clients across the country, some in Europe, actually. Um, I've been in existence for a number of years now. My background goes about 12, 13 years in the finance industry. Um, I came up the ranks at a number of different, you know, kind of Wall Street level firms, big asset management firms, um, you know, managing in like the multi billions and trillions of dollars. So that was kind of like where I cut my teeth. And then a number of years ago, which is kind of why it's relevant in this conversation, I was preparing, decided to launch my own business and open my own financial planning firm. And so I kind of went through the evolution of, you know, I always knew that I was entrepreneurial. I knew I wasn't going to stay in corporate America forever. I just didn't know what. And so I kind of did my planning. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about budgeting and numbers and finance today and how you can like look at it from that perspective. And, uh, and then I launched. And then for the last number of years, I've been obviously like any um, small business initially, you're starting at ground zero day one, um, you know, zero clients or, or sales or whatever you want to track it by. And then uh, building that up and, and how can you do that? And, um, and so today I'm going to talk about that and really, you know, when I was talking with Katie and Nicole originally back, I think in the fall or the winter about doing this, you know, the idea was kind of, it started with some people asking about like budgeting, right? And numbers. And then I was thinking more about it broadly and the, the concept or the idea that I had in my mind, which I thought might be hopefully relevant to all of you and helpful is, is this idea of like giving yourself enough time or runway to hit that inflection point in a business, right? At any, for any business, no matter where you are, like day one, you most likely have zero revenue, right? And how do you get to that point in which you're no longer worried about going out of business? Um, whatever that means for your business or, or whatever you're doing. And so um, how do we do that? How do you give yourself the, the ability to do that? And so that's kind of what I want to dive through today. Um, as Katie mentioned, um, you know, we kind of got a little bit of an intimate group. I'm sure plenty of people will maybe tune in later on, but I'm happy to for this to be interactive. So if like I'm talking about something, I'm, I'm fine on my feet. You know, I, if you go want to jump in and ask a question, feel free. Um, so we don't have to wait to the Q and a Katie. Um, if someone wants to dive into, we can always dive a little deeper. I'll probably talk. I think I didn't, I haven't timed it, but I have got a bunch of notes I want to go through and thoughts that I want to put out there maybe a half hour or so, um, total. So plenty of time for like Q and a and whatever, um, you all want to dive into. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so and I have just so you know, I have muted you all. If you want to unmute yourself to talk, go for it. Um, I just just in case there's dogs barking or whatnot in the background, we'll we'll deal with that. <laughs> sure. Um, so as you as Katie mentioned a second ago, obviously, you know, when we were setting this up uh, some months ago, that was pre like craziness, right? So like pre isolation, quarantine, lockdown, coronavirus, all this craziness. So um, like I said, when, when this whole program that Katie and Nicole were setting up is more was at least from my knowledge designed to kind of help people who are going to go into business for the first time in the next year or so get prepared. And, but you know, we thought about it and I wanted to kind of obviously incorporate those who might already be in business. Um, but it's almost like you're starting over. I mean, when the government's basically shutting down businesses and you have to stop for two or three months, depending on the type of business, you're kind of starting from scratch. I mean, maybe you're going to have clients that will come back right away. Maybe you don't. Um, so like I said, ultimately, 
you know, whether you're going to be starting a business in the future or you're in your, you have a business and you're kind of starting over. Um, that's like I mentioned before, I want to talk about how do you get back to, or for the first time to that point where you're not worried about failing. And of course, I mean, you want to go beyond this, right? Um, obviously everyone wants to thrive and get to like a, a high level of revenue and profits and all that stuff. But I think that this is a significant point in a business because it allows you to go from being on the defensive, like in those early uh, days, weeks, months to on the offensive and really be investing. Um, like we heard, I think, uh, you know, Kathleen, you just mentioned, I mean, you're buying a building for your business, right? So that's great. It's more like an offensive move. So, um, so the, I guess the question I'll just, propose it out there if someone wants to answer or I can just answer for you. Um, I think there's a lot of like important goals for businesses when they're setting out. And, you know, when I think about what is one of the most important goals of any business, um, I think it's just staying in business, at least initially, right? And so, you know, we could have like revenue goals, profitability goals, sales goals, all these things could be um, crucial to like your specific industry. But at the end of the day, I mean, when you're month one, how do you get to month two and then month six and month 12, right? And so, you know, I think that's one of the most crucial things that people need to focus on. And in order to do that, um, I was talking with Nicole and Katie about this, about some of the stats around like businesses. And I'm sure some of you have heard these, like why does one business fail, but another succeeds? And, you know, there's a lot of stats out there, like in the first one to five years, like 90 plus percent of small businesses fail. Um, and that's like a, a staggering statistic if you think about it, you know, like literally more than nine out of 10 people who start a business, even in good times, let alone like right now, are going to struggle and it's going to be tough. And, and, you know, so how do you get past that? And one of the things that I always struggle with is like, why is that? Like, why do businesses fail? And of course, there's like a ton of variables, like there could be a lot of things that go into it. But ultimately, I think that, you know, at a very base level, if we keep it very simple, you know, businesses fail because they run out of money, right? Like whether your revenue isn't high enough or your overhead and expenses are too high, whatever it is, that calculation is off and you just have to go out of business because you no longer have money, you have enough money to sustain, whether it's to pay leases for office space, for, for technologies, tools, staff, you name it. And one of the other parts of this is that I see a lot of businesses fail because the owner's personal lifestyle demands too much of the business early on. You know, my core, my core like service offering for my business is personal financial planning. But over the last year and a half, I actually have worked with a lot of business owners and I help them with business consulting, business coaching. And it's amazing how a lot of the times, you know, we struggle to separate a business's finances from our own. And it's, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense because when that's your only source of income, you know, it's kind of, they go hand in hand, right? But if you're pulling too much money out of your business, it's really tough to allow it to thrive and get to that point. So that's one of the big things that I've seen. And there's this thought that I've had in my mind, and I heard someone talk about it a while ago, that kind of like kills me. It, you know, thinking about all the businesses that shut down, but we're only months away from that inflection point, but they just couldn't get to that point. And if for some reason, like they had been given two or three or four more months, they would have hit that point. And that's kind of like those, one of those weird questions or stats that we just will never know the answer to, because it's just an impossible um, question to answer. But, you know, how do you get people to that point? Another thing that I think is uh, interesting, you hear a lot about these like romantic success, uh, success stories about someone being down to like their last month of money, maxing out their credit card, or like pulling off like a big win in the 11th hour. And I just think that, you know, ultimately, like those are the exceptions to the rule. Like you typically don't see if a business is down to its last month of like operating income, they're probably not going to make it to the next month. Like it's not. So how do you avoid that scenario? Um, so the next thing I want to hit upon is in, in my mind, like what are the like the keys to success? Right. Um, and getting to that point. And I want to hit upon this before we dive into more like the nitty gritty part of like what I'm going to talk about. And I think you know, ultimately, if you're starting a business, you're going to have to work your butt off. Like I think anyone who's even been involved, maybe it's not your own business, but like a part of a startup, you know that it's going to be struggle early on and you're going to have to grind and work a lot of hours. I heard, I think there's like a quote, right? It's like, um, you know, opening your own business is like trading, working eight hours for someone else to working like 
16 hours for yourself, right? So, you know, you get to call the shots and you get to, you know, direct everything, but now everything is your responsibility. So I think at a baseline, like going into it, we know that you're going to have to work super hard. Even if you have a good product or a service that people want, you're going to have to push hard. And, um, and even sometimes a good product or a good idea will fail. You know, I have a, a, a really close friend of mine that um, I think probably Richard can, uh, with the startup weekend stuff can, can assimilate to is um, I had a buddy who did the startup weekend in Boston like eight years ago, seven, seven, eight years ago. And they went into this and they came up with this amazing idea for like an infant monitor monitoring system to like track an infant while they're like sleeping and to avoid things like sudden infant death syndrome and all this stuff. And it was like back then that didn't exist. And so they had this amazing like kind of blue market strategy where there wasn't a lot of competition. People were jumping on it and they were getting all this publicity. They ended up winning the startup weekend. They won the mass challenge. They got a hundred thousand dollars in non-diluting funds. All this stuff was going their way and they still failed. And so there's so many hurdles against you. And, and I think part of that was just not having enough time. Like they kind of ran out and also their skill sets weren't there. Um, if you talk to my buddy, he'll tell you, he said like back then he was not prepared to run a business, like from a skill set. He didn't know he was an engineering background. He wasn't a business person. And, and the reason I bring that up is because we're talking about runway, giving yourself time. Sometimes you need the time to develop the skills on the fly while you're running a business, right? No one jumps into an, an entrepreneurial venture, typically, um, if it's their first, especially, with all the skill sets you need and all the knowledge to run a business efi uh, efficiently. So once again, like having enough time maybe to get enough revenue, but then also to build up the skill sets that you need to be a good business owner and a good manager. So I'm just kind of hammering right now the points of like why it's so important to give yourself plenty of runway and plenty of time um, and having enough to hit that inflection point. And I think one of the big things that I see people do is they just don't do the research going into it. Like they're not going into the venture eyes wide open. So like, let's take, for example, I'm not going to dive into specific industries because everyone's in like a different industry, but let's say that you do research about whatever industry you're going to go into. And the typical business that succeeded took them 18 months to reach their break even point and start making money, right? Well, if you only have one year's worth of runway saved up, there's a huge gap there, right? Like you have a big problem. So sure, like maybe you can beat the odds and accelerate the process, but most likely not, right? Like, are you going to be the exception to the rule and be better than anyone else before you? So I think that's kind of like a key part in this is kind of understanding what you're getting yourself into. What is the ex expectation of like the type of business you're going to start and how long it typically takes that type of business in that industry to really take off and understand what that requires, um, like what that timeline is, right? Because obviously like um, entrepreneurs by nature are optimistic. I mean, you're, you're literally, we, we, I just laid off all these statistics, right? Like 90 plus percent of people fail in entrepreneurship. Well, I mean, if you're going to open a business, you're already trying to beat the odds, right? So it's nice to be optimistic and, 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 uh, and really like, well, optimistic about it and positive, but we need to go in and make sure we understand what's happening. So how do you do this, right? Like how do you give yourself sufficient time to reach that critical point? And I mean, it really starts with understanding your numbers. And that's when we're, I'm gonna dive in right now, a little bit of like the, the budgeting side, right? Everyone's favorite word uh, in the world of finance. Um, you know, I, I find it's funny, like whether it's personal or business, like it seems like no one likes to do budgeting. Um, but it's more important than you probably are considering. And I always tell people, whether it comes down to your personal finances or business, budgeting and like understanding your numbers isn't about necessarily like handcuffing yourself or, um, you know, telling yourself what you can and cannot do. It, it definitely is part of that, but it's about control. Like when you have knowledge and, and understanding of what's happening in like your personal life and business, it gives you control and empowers you to actually make smart decisions. Um, I started working with this one woman about six months ago and she, you know, she reached out to me originally as just a personal financial planning client. I've been working with her and her husband and it turns out she also has a business on the side. Uh, she does like therapy sessions for people and right now a lot of virtual stuff. And, um, and it's interesting. One of the, the issues she was having, especially recently, is that you know her husband got furloughed and so now a lot of the households 
finances are kind of falling on her, at least I should say like income. And she was struggling with how much she can take out of the business. And we were going back and forth and I was kind of asking a lot of questions and, and, you know, trying to really figure out what the problem was and why she was having trouble with this. And it turns out she does not have any type of budget for her business. And she literally, I'm not going to name names here, but like she literally could not tell me what her monthly overhead was for her business. So if you don't even know what the expenses, like the baseline expenses to operate your business, your venture are on a monthly basis, of course you don't know how much you can pull out of it. And you don't know how much you can reinvest into marketing or new technologies or anything else. Um, so that's why I say like the first kind of level of having this control and then also being able to extend your runway is knowing your numbers, right? And so how do we get a hold of our numbers and budget so we can be effective business owners? Um, I'm not going to put it up right now. Um, there's a link that uh, Katie and I can share with the group and anyone else listening it has a link to a bunch of, I think it's five different free online budgeting templates you can use. Um, I'm not going to go nitty gritty and I don't want people like fidgeting with it while I'm talking so we can all stay interactive. Um, but I'll definitely send that to you. But what I want to talk to you about is like how to think about budgeting from, from a baseline level. Of course, depending on your industry, like the line items are going to change and maybe how you structure it. So, but what's like the high level? Um, you know, every, every industry is different in what you'll need to account for. Um, but the main thing is you need to follow, I think, a set of steps, which is exactly what I did when I was getting ready to launch my business. Um, you know, the steps that I think about that will help you like budget effectively is one, as I mentioned before, I think you really need to begin by researching what it will take to run your business, right? At the most basic level, you know, what's like the absolute lowest number of expenses and technologies or tools that you could do with to actually keep things going. Now, of course, this is gonna be vastly different from one industry to the next. Like if we just think about, you know, like a restaurant, right? Like a restaurant owner versus like a freelance website developer. You know, a restaurant owner needs like, they have a ton of overhead with lease, opening a space, uh, cooking equipment, staff, chefs, you name it. Uh, if you're just an independent freelance website developer, you can literally work out of your home or apartment and just, you got to market online and find people, right? And then you can, yeah, maybe some tools and technology. So those numbers are going to be drastically different. Um, the next is, I think it, it always makes sense to build out kind of your wish list of like all the awesome tools and technologies that you'd love to have at your disposal if money wasn't an issue. And, and you know, what are the things that, let's say, really successful businesses in your industry are utilizing, but are maybe out of like, reach right now for where you are from a financial standpoint. And, and what you need to do with that list ultimately is you need to st uh, start ranking that list in order of importance and cost, right? So one, um, you need to know how much is going to cost. So like, let's say you hit that point where you're starting to feel a little, you know, loose about your, your, your profitability, you're feeling good about things, but you've got like a few hundred dollars extra each month, right? To play with. Well, then you probably can't afford like the $2,000 technology that it's going to cost you, right? Um, but you also want to rank it in level of importance of what you think is going to have the biggest impact on your business. So, you know, here's the baseline stuff that you need to have to run. What's that next tool or technology, or maybe it's hiring a staff or something along those lines that's going to help you level up to the next point. And the reason I bring that up is that a lot of the things that people struggle with in finance, um, that I see is making decisions in the heat of the moment when you haven't thought about it beforehand. And so what this does is kind of let you look into the future. And so you know what you're going to do before you kind of get like, you know, um, before you get into that moment and you're not quite sure what to do, or someone's dangling some other tool or technology that might be neat to have, but is not necessarily uh, not necessary or might not be the best use of your, you know, uh, new assets and profitability. Um, so I think that's like kind of like a very, high level, like macro level way to look at budgeting. Like I said, there's a lot of templates out there. You get very nitty gritty, but you need to think about one, what are your baseline level of expenses? Cause you don't want to get in over your head. And then two, what are all those, like what would be nice to have and rank those in an order of importance. Um, you know, I think back to one of my other buddies who started a, a business a number of years ago, he started a, um, a consulting business in the textile and tech space. And he started off just doing, uh, you know, well, I'll just leave it at like consulting for a lot of companies. 
And then he ended up realizing that there was this big gap in the industry where um, there was no central place for people in, the, in that industry to kind of communicate. And so you could have some company with an amazing innovative technology over here and that another one was starting some type of like clothing line that could have integrated that, but they had no idea they existed. So we started to build this platform and it was great. Like there's a great adoption. People were loving it. And the team that built it for them, um, they asked him if he wanted to build an app, you know, for, for phones. And he had a website, but he didn't have an app. And for anyone who um, maybe has been involved in more technological space, a lot of people might think that like, oh, you have a website, just create an app, right? But actually like creating an app is like a completely different thing. And it's like basically doubling or more the cost of like what you build out the platform for. So it's not just like, oh, flip a switch and you've got an app for your website. It's a much bigger endeavor. And so he ultimately decided not to do that at that time. And, and some people were asking him about that, but his idea was like, let me see what the actual adoption is for the platform. What's the demand? And then if there's a strong demand and it's going to actually make sense, we'll invest in that. And so I think, um, you know, I think about it, like I have a website, like, which it'd be cool to have an app, but like, is, does it make sense? And is it going to really drive your business's growth? It's like those type of decisions you need to kind of put on the back burner and be willing to make um, that I think will help you extend your runway. And for him um, being a, a solo consultant with a business and he had a wife and kids. I mean, there are a lot of personal expenses too putting out some thousands and thousands of dollars for an app was going to really eat into his runway. And so I thought that was a pretty smart decision in his behalf. Um, the next uh, kind of area in the budgeting process is I think a lot of people miss, especially business owners. Actually, let me scratch that. Most people miss this, um, especially business owners, is that your personal finances. You know, like I mentioned it before, you really can't separate the two. If you're lucky enough, as an entrepreneur to maybe have a spouse that's working full time. Like sometimes you can lean on that income and you're not, your back isn't quite up against the wall. Um, but if you're either a sole income earner, whether you're in a relationship or not, or you're just single and that's your source of income, all your finances are being driven through that business, right? So if you don't have a, if you don't have control over your personal finances, it's going to be tough. And, um, and like I mentioned before, like, it's the control and understanding how much you can pull in and out of the business and not being too burdensome. And so when you're doing your budgeting for your personal finances, it's not too dissimilar than what I actually mentioned earlier. I mean, obviously um, you've probably heard a lot about like budgeting. I'm not going to go into like all the templates. There's a lot of templates you can use for that as well, but ultimately same thing. You want to get your base level of expenses. Like what do you need to survive without like any frills or anything like that? And, uh, and like whether it's your rent or mortgage or like food costs, right? And how low can you actually get your personal expenses so they aren't as big of a burden on your business? And then after that, you know, all the other things that you do in life and, and you spend money on, you know, what do you really not need? What are, what are discretionary uh, expenditures that you could cut out? And then it becomes like that balance, right? Like the more you can cut out early on, especially while you're just starting a business, the more runway you're going to have. It's that simple. Um, and it's all about planning ahead and deciding what you're going to add back in before you get there. Um, and so, like I said, business owners, new business owners are going to be working a ton. So you might not even have a lot of time to go out and like, you know, hang out with friends and, and spend money, um, which is, you know, I guess good or bad, depending on how you look at it for your business. Um, but you need to also have a strong control over, um, over what's happening in order to be able to make those decisions. Um, the next thing is really thinking about like planning out your runway. Now, for those who haven't started a business yet, you know, you want to plan out how much you want to have saved up before you launch your business. Now, this is, you know, a little bit of debatable because obviously the more money you have saved up, like forget about the dollar amount, the more, the better, right? Cause it's just going to give you more breathing room, but also the more you need saved up, the longer it may take you to save up that money. So you're just pushing off the launch of your business. So it's kind of like this balance of like, when is enough to keep saving? Um, and when do you need more? Um, you know, I think about like for my industry, you know, I mentioned this earlier, like doing your homework, doing your research for a financial planning firm, um, for a lot of firm owners, you know, um, it's not dissimilar. A lot of firms, uh, more firms fail than they succeed. 
um, I looked around, I talked to a lot of people and it was clear to me that around three years was like the point where you saw firms really starting to take off. You know, of course there are some that bucked the trend and took off in their first year or two, um, usually because they had a lot of money to invest in like advertising and marketing, but there are some that, you know, bucked the trend anyways. And so for me, I was thinking, okay, well, I'm going to bust my butt. I think I'm a pretty savvy business person, but maybe I'm just, you know, um, yeah, I have an illusion about myself. I want to have at least three years saved up of savings combined with my budget for my um, baseline for my business and then personal expenses. Now I happen to be like a single guy with no kids. So, you know, I don't have like other mouths to feed. So worst case scenario back then when I was starting my business, I was like, heck, I can go back to, you know, college days, eat ramen noodles, right? Like you literally spend no money on food and that type of stuff. And that's what it might, may take and like cut out as much as I can. And so what I said to myself was once I hit three years of savings and runway, that's when I'll feel ready to go. And that's what I did. And so for you, whatever your industry is, you kind of have to think about once that, what I mentioned before is what is the expectation in your industry? And then what level of savings are you comfortable with having a runway to actually go and launch? Um, and of course, what other support structures? I mean, maybe you don't need that because you do have, you know, someone else who you can lean on, someone else to help support you, a spouse, something like in that nature where you have another income. So there's other variables that factor into it, but you also, like I said, need to go in eyes wide open. Um, so the next point I want to mention is you know, like, how do you create more runway, right? Um, so let's say that either you don't have the ability to save up a ton of money, like maybe whatever it is, like you're just not in a job right now that's paying a ton or, you know, or you just need some extra money in general. How do you get it? And the first thought, a lot of like either new entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs go to is how can I get money from a bank, small business association, a grant and on and on, right? Like where's the free money that like, where's this big piggy bank that I can just get free money for nothing. And like for certain there are resources out there. And if there are things available to you, then have at it. I'm not saying like you shouldn't do that. If someone's just going to give you like free money as a grant, but these aren't always available and they aren't always the best course of action. And the reason I say that is for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of people will go after this pool of money, but the kicker is that people with bad money habits that come into a lot of money, they soon no longer have that money, right? Like if you have buddy, bad money habits and someone gives you a bunch of money, you're probably going to uh, misappropriate that money, whether it's in your business or your personal finances. Like we, you hear about like stories, if you read about like venture capital, a lot of money goes wasted on startups that are poorly managed, right? The actual, going back to my buddy, right? I mean, they were given a $100,000 grant, non-diluting fund for Mass Challenge. You know, they had a great idea and, you know, it ended up not working, right? So you could say, you could argue that $100,000 was, you know, quote unquote, wasted, right? Um, just because they weren't, he, he'll tell you, they weren't equipped to run and operate and grow a business at that time. They had a great idea. They all had good skill sets. It wasn't, the, the, uh, the stars didn't align for them. Um, I also hear like, you know, not to get off a little bit off topic, but just talking about money, um, you know, you probably hear a lot about professional athletes, right? Like a lot of professional athletes go bankrupt after they stop playing their sports. And that's because they never had good money habits. They get millions of dollars. And then what happens when the money starts, stops coming in, they, they blow it. Right. Um, and then the same thing, um, you probably heard of like the lottery curse, like not everyone, but a lot of people who win the lottery actually end up like going bankrupt uh, a number of years later. So I'm just hitting upon a few of these like examples to show you that, you know, you want to have a strong control over your finances, even before you go and just try and get a bunch of extra money. Um, it will help either way, but it's not going to necessarily be like the, uh, the end all be all and like the savior that some people are looking for. Um, another way to look at this is like, how do you stretch out your one way is like one, this probably maybe seems like simple or straightforward, but I'm just going to say it anyways, like lower your business expenses, right? If your business, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier is what's your actual baseline level that you need to operate your business. And I think a lot of people kind of get ahead of their skis and they see all these cool gadgets and technologies that they think would be cool to have. And maybe they just aren't really necessary. So you can stretch out your runway by lowering your business expenses Two, 
once again, this might be a uh, yeah, duh, Jared, but like increase revenue. Like how do you do that? Right. Um, and, and any way possible, you could also increase your personal earnings from things like side hustles or the gig economy is a big one these days. Right. Um, especially in the early stages, I had a buddy, uh, well, I have a buddy. I know some know him. Um, he is a real estate agent. And when he first started as a real estate agent, I mean, he's doing well now, but he was literally washing dishes on the side. Um, and obviously like when he first started, he didn't have a flood of like buyers or listings that he had. He was trying to get those, but he did have a lot of time. So he'd be marketing and any spare time he had, he was just going out and working for minimum wage and just getting as much money as he could until he started to get inundated with the good stuff, which is more buyers and listings and all that type of stuff. So that might not be for you washing dishes, but like what is something that you can do in the early stages? Cause one of the things that a business owner has early on is time. And it's like, how do you allocate that? It's nice when you get to that point where you have so many clients that you don't have time. So all that revenue is coming in, but early on, that's probably not the point or uh, not the place you're in. So like, how do you allocate that time? And so you got to balance it out between working on the business, growing the business, but then also maybe how can you pull in some money on the side to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time? Um, you know, there's also, uh, I'm not going to list it out here. And I mean, I know Katie uh, and, and Nicole know a lot of these resources. I have a friend who works at Pioneer Bank and I know they're building out a list of resources for all the different lenders in the area, um, small business association grants, all that type of stuff. So we can uh, shoot you that list afterwards. Um, and that is something, like I said, I don't like for people to immediately go to that first. I think you need to get all your, your like foundational stuff set, but then of course go after, um, go after any money you can get. Obviously it's going to help you. Um, so, I mean, like I said before, uh, at the end of the day, like understanding your numbers by doing that, you will be, you'll be better equipped to make decisions in both good and bad times. You know, right now things are actually looking pretty bleak for a lot of small business owners. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Like when the government is literally telling you, you can't operate, like, what are you supposed to do? Right. So, and there's a huge debate going on. I'm not going to get into it here, but about, you know, people who are literally, they're not able to take care of themselves, their family, provide an income. And they're saying, listen, I want to go work. I'm willing to take that risk. And so there's a huge thing, uh, debate going on right now. And for those who have been affected, you have to look at it for ways to create more runway in order to get back to the level of profitability that you once were at. And we don't know how long this is going to take. Like, frankly, if, if Cuomo opens up tomorrow, like, does that mean everyone's going to flood all the restaurants out there? Like, probably not. And they're talking about a lot of changes for how they do it. And I don't know how it's going to affect each and all of your industries, right? So some of the interesting things that I've seen out there is a lot of business owners are innovating right now, right? So like, I know that Dominic down doing the Feed Albany, right? I mean, they've got restaurants and they're now shifted a lot of their resources to actually doing good while also bringing in some revenue for, for the business and keeping people employed. Restaurants that typically didn't do takeout or online ordering are shifting to that. A lot of businesses are going digital as, as Kathleen mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, I think ultimately what, what this is, is it, it's not necessarily saying that these actions are going to be wildly profitable for these businesses. They might not be glamorous. They might not be what they want, but they're innovative. And what they're doing is they're giving themselves more runway, right? And so they're giving themselves runway in order to hopefully get back to that point where they were at prior to all this craziness going down. Um, so I want to talk to you real briefly about like, what am I doing in my business right now? You know, I fortunately enough have not been like dramatically affected by this. A lot of my clients are like I mentioned earlier in the call from around the country. I have some in Europe. So a lot of my clients are used to working virtually anyways, doing conference calls, right? I have some in, in Albany area, but plenty of people um, have been working with me. They find me online. And, um, and so when I, Coming into this, obviously, there's an immediate amount of like fear, like what's going to happen? How is your business going to be affected? And, you know, what's fortunate is that I have a strong understanding of my financials, both personal finances and, excuse me, on the, on the business side. And so what I've decided to do is make a more proactive decision to kind of take this whole challenge head on. Now, if you read a lot of books on whether it's business or what successful entrepreneurs have done over time, 
you'll eventually come across stories of how businesses made it through really tough times and how some actually came out the other end of the tunnel even better and really thrived. So it is usually because instead of getting defensive and, and backing down, they went on the offensive in a tough time. And so I say this to you with a little bit of grain of salt because in order to do this, you have to actually have the ability to do that. And you need to have some money saved up um, to be able to invest in your business. And so you need to understand, once again, your business's situation. It's all about knowledge, all about understanding of where you are to be able to make decisions. Um, and, you know, of course, these are very crazy times right now um, where your business might not be like mine or someone else's. But instead of focusing on how things have changed and how you are in a tough situation, I really think like, um, you know, you can look to innovate and see how you can survive and increase your runway. So um, I would never be able to do this if I didn't have a firm understanding and control over my business's finances and being able to tell you what am I spending on a monthly basis and also being able to take a step back in my personal life. You know, I saw this happening. And I'm like, okay, well, just being indoors all this time, we're all going to cut down our spending a little bit, right? Like you're not spending as much on gas, like traveling, but, um, but where else can you cut back and say, okay, time's going to be tough for my business. I need to cut back so I can keep the business going and extend that runway out. Um, so ultimately what, like, what can we take away from, you know, this whole conversation, this presentation on money mindset, you know, budgeting, I think ultimately um, the finances of a business are its lifeline. You know, it not only keeps the business operating, it allows the owner to make informed decisions on what is feasible for the business and what is not feasible. Like I mentioned before, my, my client earlier, if you can't tell me what your monthly overhead is, how can you possibly make an educated decision on where you can invest in your business or not? So you can't look at your business's finances as something that isn't important. It's arguably one of the most important parts of the business. And also, you can't look at your personal finances as something separate from your business. Now, certainly you want to keep them separate, right? But both have a great impact on one another. And if your personal finances aren't in order, then you will have a very difficult time properly running your business's finances. So uh, that's where we're going to wrap up. Um, you know, ultimately I hope um, that's kind of insightful and, uh, and definitely want to open up the questions and, and conversation. If any of you have a question or want to dive into any of the things we chatted about, I'd be happy to do so, Katie. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, or if you just have something you want to talk through or anything, um, we are live on Facebook. So if anybody comments on that, I'll definitely let you know. Um, we, you know, I, when I think about so many of these businesses that are in this really tough position right now where they're, I mean, a, a lot of them are in very different situations, um, depending on their industry and depending on how they've been affected, what kind of finances they have for savings and all those kinds of things. Um, when, when I've looked at some of the surveys that we've collected and the information from that, I mean, 25% of about 100 people who responded to a survey had said that they had no idea how long they could last in this. Um, how can someone like that, who at this point has no clue how how much longer they can last, how can they start to kind of build that, um, that financial Mechanic. stability for themselves and understand? Yeah, I mean, when I first start working with someone, usually like when it's on a, like a personal financial planning side, like a lot of times they just don't know what their spending habits are. It's the same thing with the business. So if someone's at that point, I usually tell them to do what, I don't even call it a budget, I call it a spending analysis. And so basically like look back over the last three to six months, of your personal or your business's finances. And you know, you don't have to judge, but just be aware and, and actually budget that out and see where your money actually went. You know, a lot of times we have like a um, vision of like how we act, like how we spend. Um, when you actually dig through the numbers, you're like, oh man, I didn't realize I was spending so much on X or Y, right? And a lot of the times people will have like an aha moment and be like, I don't even care about that stuff. Or like, why am I spending on that, right? It's not something of value to them or importance. So it's like usually you'll find some areas that are easily cut out. And so I think that that's a starting point is really just start going back through your numbers over the last handful of months. Um, probably I would say before the, the whole isolation hit, right? Because you want to know like, well, I mean, now is, is crucial too, but also you want to see like what it is during like normal times, um, spending levels. And then and that'll start to give you some, you know, awareness of how much the business is actually 
uh, go, like blow, going through money. And then once again, it's, it's, well, I would say the tough part is even once you know that right now, there are a lot of industries that have a big question mark because some aren't even allowed to open right now. And so to answer the question, how long, you know, can you survive? Well, if you're not allowed to open, like you can't survive, right? Like indefinitely, like you're, you're done. But if it's opens in a month from now, how long of a runway do you have? Can you start back up? Is your business one that people are going to immediately come back to, right? Um, is it a type of service or product or whatever that you will see? Or is it like, you know, we're talking about a lot of the restaurant industry right now, some of the rules and regulations around how much capacity they can even allow in. So I think if I was talking to like a restaurant owner, I would be factoring in like, well, even if you can't open up at 100%, where's it going to be? And how long, how's that going to affect your runway and your projections? And so I think you got to really look at it from both um, understanding what has happened in the past and then projecting out maybe what would be like ideal, but then also planning down like what are some levels below that, you know? So if like restaurants are only allowed to open up at, I don't know, 50% capacity, what's that going to do? Like how, how do they operate and, and can they operate that way? Anybody else have any questions? I, I can ask some more questions too. If you need to. <laughs> Uh, Jared, I don't have a question, but I, I did want to thank you just for your for your time and, and what you offered to us this morning. Absolutely. My pleasure, Nicholas. Um, when we look at, uh, you know, some of these stats and we ask very specifically, like, what what resources are you looking upon right now? Are you looking at your personal finances? Are you, um, you know, your savings accounts? Are you... Um, kind of calling on friends and family to help you get through this time? Are you um, looking for grants or loans? Are you worried about paying those things back? We, we did notice that most people are calling on their personal uh, finance or their personal kind of savings accounts right now. Um, what's the concern in that? Is there anything wrong with doing that at this point to kind of sustain yourself through this time? Um, or should be, should be people be looking more at those grants or loan opportunities or do you have any thoughts on that you mean like the the uh debate between like taking out a personal loan versus like a grant or something like that yeah i mean i think some people right now are kind of running down their personal savings uh to keep their business afloat um okay. what's i guess the concern in that versus um going through a grant process or a loan process um, would you suggest that somebody look more right now at a loan versus um, using some of their personal savings, not understanding how long this might last. Sure. So, um, you know, we're talking about like, when you're talking about like investing or business or anything, I mean, let's face it. It's always like from like a selfish uh, standpoint for anyone who's an entrepreneur, it's always better to risk someone else's money than yours. Right. So like if you could get a, a grant that's non-diluting of your equity and that doesn't have to be repaid or like one of these like loans that the government's doing the stimulus, why wouldn't you just take free money? You know, like it's going to help you. Um, I mentioned earlier, they're really like, depending on how you're set up, there really, there should be from like a operational standpoint, a delineation between your personal and business finances, but there really isn't right. Like I own my financial planning firm. I also own some like real estate and other things, but for all intents and purposes, I don't have another job. Like, I, if my business were to crater and go down, like I need, luckily I have savings, but if I don't have that income coming in, I'm just going to be dipping into my savings. Right. So they're, they're hand in hand. And so, um, people who are drawing down their personal savings, I mean, it's all one big bucket in reality. And I, and I don't like to tell people to look at it like that, but you're basically, that's why I keep saying like throughout the presentation, you need to have both budgets in check. And, um, you need to understand both sides of it because if your business is pulling in, let's say your business is pulling in a hundred thousand dollars in profits. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty solid, right? For, I think most people starting off, they'd be happy to get to a six figure profitability. Well, if you're spending $150,000 a year, well then your business isn't going to last very long, right? You're going to be such a burden on that business. You're going to go out of business. So I think one, you can't really, um, you have to like from an operational standpoint, delineate, but you really can't from like a actual in actuality. And, um, but to my point earlier, yeah, I mean, if you can get, um, free money, I mean, go for it. I mean, if there are loans and grants out there and stuff like that, that's right, Richard. Like, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna, I would never, I was saying 
the, my point earlier in the, in the middle of the presentation wasn't to not go get that money. It's that people who haven't taken care of the other stuff and don't have a strong understanding who then try and go get a $10,000 grant or loan, you're going to blow through that money so fast. It's not going to make a difference, right? You're not going to know how to lengthen that out to give you six months instead of two months, right? You'll go through it in two months and you, and you missed out on a potential four months of runway. So that's what I mean by that. But by all means, like, yeah, I mean, leverage any resources uh, you can. And, and frankly, if you're in a tough spot and depending on how much time you have, you should be applying to every single one of them, you know, and just trying to, it's like a shotgun approach, getting as much as you can. So absolutely. Richard, did you have any thoughts or questions? You, you've shaken your head a lot, so looks like you're it. No, oh, this is all good stuff. I wanted to second what Nicholas said and thank you, uh, Jared, for putting this on for us. My pleasure. Um, I'm not seeing any comments on the, um, on the live feed. Uh, if anybody's watching live, feel free to comment or um, sign up for the program and come in uh, to it as well. Uh, but otherwise we can, um, we can see if there's any questions that come later uh, and then we can send those along to you as well. Uh, is there anything that, um, you know, when we think about, when we think of, about a person who is in the position where they maybe have lost their, their job, um, they're thinking about starting a business, um, but, you know, everything is a little confusing right now uh, and difficult right now. So what would you say to somebody who has lost their job, has been thinking about opening a business, and is about to start something uh, just because they have you know, nothing else going on right now. Uh, yeah. What would you say to somebody like that? I think I would say a few things. Like one, that's, I mean, it's just unfortunate, the tough spot we're all put in right now. I mean, everyone's being affected on different levels from what's happening. Um, you know, it's just, it's just tragic. Like some people are, who've been running businesses for years, did nothing wrong, and they're probably going to go out of business because of this, right? Um, or people, to your point, who are losing their jobs and going on unemployment. I think one of the things that I think back to, I think a number of years ago, um, I was having a debate with someone on this, like a little discussion on like, are people inherently entrepreneurs? Or like, are you or are you not an entrepreneur? And one of the things that I, that was like sticking in my mind was like, you know, my great grandmother and those, they're not around anymore. They passed away years ago, but back in the era of like depression, right? The depression times, people would literally go like door to door and offer services for just like bowls of soup and things like that. And so when you're back against the wall, like people will do whatever it takes to survive. And they say like, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So if you are in a situation where you've been laid off and you've got to now figure things out, it's going to, I don't want to say like, that's the way people should get into entrepreneurship. Um, certainly that's like a tough route into it, but you know, it drives people to actually do things that maybe are out of their comfort zone. Right. And so I would say that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, one of the things you need to do, obviously, if you're put in that situation is once again, like I keep going back to this and harping on it, but you need to kind of put all of your, your personal finances in check. So if I was laid off from a job, I would immediately be thinking, like same thing, as I said before, like where can I cut expenses immediately? You know, how do I get back to a level where I can at least stand on my own two feet and then start getting into something? And if you're at that level, um, you're probably not going to have a bunch of savings. So, or maybe you do. I don't want to say that. Maybe someone's doing really well. They just got laid off. But in any case, if you do or don't, um, you need to be going into that venture, understanding how much you're going to be able to invest and how much you need to bootstrap it. And obviously, like if you're in the entrepreneurial world, I mean, you hear the term bootstrapping. I mean, it's basically doing everything yourself, right? I mean, early on, um, I remember, like I have a, a blog and a podcast for my, my company and stuff. And, uh, you know, early on, I was producing, I was recording, producing, editing all my podcasts. Like, I don't care about doing that stuff. I don't like doing that. Like, I don't want to do it, right? Um, but I didn't want to, at that time, I had money saved up. But I, in my mind, I was thinking I could pay someone to do this, right? But at, in the first month of my business, I didn't have a ton of clients. I had time, like I said before. So it's like, how do you actually set yourself up, save that money, invest in the things you can, and do as much as you can yourself um, to get to that point? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a tough situation to be put in. I think um, what if there's a silver lining in all this, um, a lot of people I hear, friends and family, and 
and uh, colleagues are talking about like this whole craziness, making them kind of reflect on the lifestyle they were living and changes they may or may not want to make, um, which I think is important. And it's something I try and do on a regular basis, even in good times. And if this is a catalyst that someone was working a nine to five job that they hate and they didn't like doing and they were miserable at, and this, you know, catapults them into entrepreneurship and doing something they're passionate about. That's awesome. I mean, the real, the real uh, X factor is being able to take a step back in your personal lifestyle and spending to be able to give it a shot. And most people, if they're in a cush job where they're making a, a good salary and they, they just don't have like those type of uh, concerns, they're just not willing to, to cut back enough to go out on their own and really give it a shot. And so maybe, maybe this is a, you know, I don't want to say like a good thing, but like it could be that catalyst to help them actually take their, their shot and opportunity. Um, but, uh, but you definitely got to, uh, definitely got to have all your stuff in order, understand where you are. And then I would say also like do a ton of research, reading, understand what you're getting into and, um, you know, get involved in, in entrepreneur groups and startup weekends and, and talk to your bids and all that type of stuff to make sure that, you know, if you're going to give it a shot, like you're, like I said, my buddy, he's, he's phenomenal. He's crushing it now, but eight years ago, he was not ready to start a business. And he'll tell you, um, how do you get yourself to a point where you can do that? We do have a suggestion on uh, the Facebook live right now. Um, so someone says, I've helped several businesses with paperwork. So finding a way to journal your daily work, income and expenses. Um, so, I mean, that's a great suggestion of, you know, looking at what you're currently uh, doing day by day uh, and how that's affecting your finances. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I think um, like, yeah, keeping track of your expenses, but that's a great point. like time management. I actually have a friend who, uh, who was, who kind of put me onto this. I do it sometimes. I, I, admittedly, admittedly, I don't do it every day, but um, it, like blocking off your, your calendar and in, like increments of 15 minutes. It's amazing. If you actually follow that, like your productivity will like, go to the roof. Um, Cause you're literally like constantly keeping yourself on point and be like, Oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, you know, instead of getting like going down some rabbit hole and getting distracted. So um, I think those are good. I'm, um Thank you, Jared. I, you know, we have a podcast episode that we filmed with, or not filmed, recorded with you uh, a couple months back. Uh, so some of the things may have changed a tiny bit, um, but that is available on downtowntroy.org. Um, so if people are interested in learning more about kind of what we've been talking about today, there is uh, that as well. Um, is there any kind of closing last minute things that you're thinking people need to keep in mind as they're kind of in this current position that they're in? Um, or, or as they're looking to start businesses? You know, I think we've hit upon a lot of the base points that I'd want to make. I, I think like, like me, my brothers, like my family, I just, I'm lucky enough that I was like, I guess trained or conditioned to be like a eternal optimist, right? So I'm always trying to see like, what are the positives in the situation? What are the silver linings? Or at least how can you make the most of something? And I mentioned earlier, a lot of these businesses that are innovating, Maybe it's not wildly profitable, but they're doing what they can to stick around and give themselves more runway. Or like we talked about earlier, if someone is laid off, how can they turn that into a positive? I mean, you hear these stories about people years later saying that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it got me out of a dead end job. And then I started my business and it's awesome. So, you know, not every story is a, is a happy ending, but I think that if you look for the happy ending or at least the path to the happy ending, you're more likely to find it. And so um, this is a crappy time for everybody. I mean, I'm doing all right, but I'm, I'm sure I would, I know for a fact that a number of prospects and potential clients have put, um, starting to work with me on hold for the time being. So it's definitely affected it, my revenue to a certain degree. I don't know how much, um, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to keep after it. Um, I think that some people have, well, it, it, it's just that, right? Like look for like the positive and, and go after it and, uh, and do all you can. I mean, that's the, the worst thing you can do is get, get, you know, ball up and, and go on the defensive and then let things happen to you, right? You got to go out and make things happen. And uh, it's maybe more difficult right now, um, more trying, especially depending on the industry. Um, when someone is telling you, you can't open your doors or something like that, but like, what can you do to stick around and give yourself that shot? Um, that's what I would say is, is uh, be positive And eventually, doors will open. Eventually we will get back to some level of normalcy. Um, you just got to be giving yourself as much of an opportunity to get to that point 
and give yourself the highest probability of success, um, no matter where you are and how good the economy is. Uh, there's always industries that are thriving. So in businesses in each industry that are thriving, even in a bad economy, are you gonna be one of those businesses that is thriving now? Well, thank you. Um, if anybody is looking to get in touch with Jared, um, we can definitely send you his contact information. Anybody that was on the signed up for the call today, um, I think we definitely had more people sign up that are probably watching it on Facebook. Uh, so uh, we'll send out some of the information to anybody who is uh, signed up for that. And then if you're all are uh, on Facebook and interested in some of that information, just let us know. Um, can you let us know your website uh, so that if people want to check you out? Yeah, real simple. Just look up Capable Wealth. Uh, across the board. Uh, I'm pretty sure own that name. There's nothing like it. So if you Google Capable Wealth, I'll pop up. My email is jared at capablewealth.com. Uh, Capable Wealth on like every social media handle. Um, you'll find me. Podcast is called Capable Wealth. Blog. I mean, you name it. So if you just look for that, you will find me um, and happy to, uh, to interact. If anyone has any other questions or wants to chat, happy to uh, give my two cents. Thank you. And if you have any questions for us as the bid, um, we're also part of the pandemic response committee for the county. So if you are a business within the county, um, feel free to reach out and we can help you um, try to work through brainstorm, whatever, whatever you need, we're here for you. So um, please reach out uh, downtowntroy.org. You can find all our information there. Thank you, Jared. Thank you to everybody who's kind of joined us on the call, whether it's through the, uh, the Zoom call today or on Facebook. Um, but we look forward to connecting with you in the future. We, we do have another um, conversation around finances uh, next week uh, with the Community Loan Fund of the Capital Region. Uh, so we'll continue talking about money this month uh, and how we can prepare ourselves, uh, especially during this time, to, to sustain us through this um, and to grow stronger for later. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. Look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you, everyone. Have a great one.